Good afternoon and welcome. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Today we're going to be talking about two very important topics with Secretary Julian Castro. Uh, my name is Briseida Castro and these two issues are affordable living and universal pre-K. Um, as you may know, Secretary Castro worked to expand access to high quality and full day pre-K. And as Secretary of HUD, he lowered mortgage insurance premiums, which makes home ownership more affordable. And he also extended non-discrimination protections in housing regulations for the LGBT community. As a woman of color and a queer woman, these protections are really important to me. But also being born and raised in Las Vegas, seeing what happened or what's going on with our gentrification downtown, that's really important. Last year, uh, firsthand, I experienced that through canvassing. I was knocking doors, asking folks what issues were important to them. And I knocked on a door of a disa disabled veteran who was really concerned about his rent. He was actually packing uh, because he couldn't afford his rent anymore. Um, and even though these are our downtown uh, population and locations are looking great and they're fun, we still have to worry about the homelessness issue that we have because as gentrification is happening, there's also going to be more homelessness. Um, so those are really important issues that are that need to be highlighted within our community. And also universal pre-K, I do have two little ones who did have the opportunity to go to pre-K, but it was all paid for and that's something that it should be for everyone. So thank you for joining us and um, Secretary Castro, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Briseida. And I like your last name, <laughs> although we're not related. We're not related. Castro, but no that. relation. Um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, for those remarks and thank you to each and every one of y'all for being here, for having me here. Uh, it's always great to be back in Las Vegas, uh, a community that in many ways represents the future of our country, a uh, community that is diverse, that it, see, you know that we're really in a house right now, right? Somebody's <laughs> living room, somebody just <laughs> rang the doorbell. Um, a, a place that is growing, is diverse, uh, with an economy that is diversifying, but also all of the tough challenges that come with opportunity, right? Uh, uh, growing um, homelessness, uh, housing prices, rent that is increasing, more families paying more than 50% of their income on rent. Also, uh, as growth happens, the need to invest in education and classrooms and to provide a great education to our young people so that they can get some of those jobs that are coming into this metro area. Folks from here, from Las Vegas, can get those jobs. Those are the same kinds of challenges that uh, people across the country are facing. Um, you know, I'm very proud in many ways of Las Vegas because uh, y'all had it very tough during the economic downturn. I remember coming to Las Vegas and hearing the stories of people who had lost just about everything. They lost their homes, they lost their you know, complete net worth, they lost their sense of stability. And uh, in the last few years, little by little, this community has gotten stronger and stronger, but there are still a lot of people that are being left out. And today I look forward to a conversation about how, can, how we can make sure in terms of housing opportunity and also educational opportunity, especially early childhood education, that everybody can prosper. Because that's what I want for the future of this country, that in the years to come, everybody can, counts and everybody can prosper. <laughs> and uh, I think that Isaiah has our first question. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Castro, my name is Isaiah. I'm 11 years old and I go to Roy Martin Middle School. The Raiders are coming to town and everyone is excited. And I'm nervous because I know my community is going to change. What can you do to make sure that no matter what happens, my family can afford to live in our community? Yeah, That's a great question, Isaiah. And uh, what grade are you in? Sixth. You're in sixth grade. All right. So you're well on your way. Um, I know that a lot of people here in the community are excited about the Raiders coming to Las Vegas. Um, yeah, I also know, though, that when you have something like that that comes to a community, 
whether it's the Raiders or it's a big investment that happens. Uh, recently, for instance, New York was considering having Amazon locate their second headquarters into New York. It doesn't look like that's going to happen, but, but they were, some people were working on that over there. A lot of times, we don't think about the other effects of that, right? The effects on whether people who live in the community, uh, how they're going to be affected by rising rents or being able to get housing that they can afford in the first place or the roads, when more people are driving on the roads in a community, how we need to invest in infrastructure, like put money into our infrastructure. Um, seats in a classroom, if you have more people that are moving into a community, uh, how are we going to accommodate those students? And so what I would say is that as president, uh, I will make sure that the dollars that we invest in local communities um, incentivize mayors and county governments across the country as well as state governments to connect the dots of these things so that when you do economic development you think about it in a holistic way it's not just about the 500 jobs that are coming to a community which are great everybody wants economic opportunity jobs right we want that but it's also about what happens to everybody else in the community um, you also ask about how we make sure that people can stay in their home. Uh, I saw a lot of people when I was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development for President Obama that were displaced. In other words, the rents went up so quickly or so high that they couldn't afford anymore to stay uh, in their home. We need to make sure that we invest in housing supply that is affordable so people have a place to live in. And also that we think about new ways in our tax code, for instance, so that renters uh, can have an opportunity to get tax credits and be able to, to you know, afford the rent as it goes up. I also believe, though, that the federal government has, has a, a role to play here, but local communities also have a big role to play. Different local communities across the country are grappling with this in different ways. Uh, they've figured out ways to uh, abate taxes for some people. Some communities have used rent control. Um, other communities have put money uh, into just more affordable housing supply. We need to do all of those things. And local communities have a role to play in understanding what's best in their own area. So I would be a strong partner, if I'm president, uh, with the state of Nevada and communities like, like Las Vegas as they grapple with these issues too. All right. And I want to add real quick, um, some of our community members are wearing headsets. Um, as a community that we are, we are very diverse, so we have Spanish speakers here today. So yeah. it's just getting translated, so I just wanted yeah. to express that. So thank you so much. Sí, gracias por venir. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, uh, Secretary Castro. My name is Mario. I've been in Las Vegas for 12 years, and I'm an educator with the Clark County School District. Uh, so my question is based on uh, universal pre-K. As an educator, education's paramount, and I'm a strong believer that education breaks the chains of poverty. Um, as president, do you have a policy or a plan or any interest in implementing something like universal pre-K? Uh, I do, and uh, my vision for this country is that in the 21st century that America should be the smartest, the healthiest, the fairest and the most prosperous nation on earth. And to be the smartest nation in the world, uh, to be the most successful when it comes to having a workforce that is skilled and is ready for 21st century jobs, it means starting early. If the research is overwhelming that if you have one dollar to spend in terms of investing in education, that dollar is best spent early when a child's mind is growing at its fastest and when you can put them on a, a great trajectory to do well in school. So when I was mayor of San Antonio, for instance, uh, we took to the voters something called pre-K for SA. We worked with uh, community leaders, business leaders, education leaders to come up with this plan that would serve 22,000 four-year-olds over the course of eight years with high quality full day pre-K. And um, you know, some people thought that we were crazy because we we're in Texas and, uh, and asking people to raise the sales tax by an eighth of a cent. Um, but I could see very clearly 
that one of the biggest challenges for my hometown was that we ranked low in educational achievement compared to cities our size, other cities. And we needed to change that. We're often very good at investing in things, you know, airports or roads or stadiums. We're not often as good at investing in people. And so I wanted to invest in people. And 53% of the voters in November of 2012 supported pre-K for SA. It wasn't universal. You know, we didn't have the resources at that time to do that. But I believe that we can do it nationally. President Obama called for universal pre-K in 2012. And uh, I support that going forward. Y yo como llegué aquí hace 23 años y hace 23 años ¿verdad? y traía a mis niños pequeños uh -huh. y mi preocupación era quién me los va a cuidar porque con un sueldo de 5 dólares la hora y luego que no, no me daban tiempo completo pues era el sufrir ¿verdad? y ahora yo veo ahora con mis hermanas con mis amistades que ocupamos más más este, guarderías para los niños ¿verdad? y que, que haya para tener a los niños más seguros porque eso de dejarlos con cualquier persona que ni conocemos pero pues no podemos hacer otra cosa más que arriesgarnos ¿verdad? preocuparnos por los niños entonces qué hay de que haya más guarderías con, con este, que no cobren tan caro que sean accesibles a, a nuestros sueldos como usted sabe muy bajitos los sueldos aquí en Las Vegas. Sí. Y uh, Rosario, uh, mucho gusto y gracias por su pregunta. Um, y uh, voy a hablar en inglés. Uh, pero, uh, so the question is about uh, the cost of child care. How we can make sure that families in our country can get affordable, reliable, safe child care. This is a huge issue for so many families across our country. And um, you know that in some cities, daycare or child care can cost more than the first year uh, of a year at college at the state university right? or community college. It's very expensive and unaffordable to a lot of families. And so what happens is that a lot of, um, a lot of parents have to leave their children with relatives or with a friend that's able to work their schedule so that they, you know, they work shifts and they can take care of their kids and other kids, another family's kids at the same time in the morning, or maybe they rotate during the week. Uh, during the course of this campaign, I look forward to putting forth a plan about universal pre-K and also child care, how we can make it affordable for all families in our country. Um, because I believe that uh, the experience that our young people get in care at a very early age also influences how well they do in school later on. I feel very blessed because uh, I grew up with my mother and my grandmother. And my grandmother was there the entire time when my mother, as a single mother, was working. My grandmother was there to take care of us uh, in the morning when my mom left early, after school, during the summers. But that's not, that's not the situation for a lot of families. We shouldn't rely on that. Uh, through our tax code, we can make it possible for families to afford child care. And I look forward to proposing a plan so that families can do that. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Castro, my name is Jose Silva. I'm from Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. I've been living in Las Vegas my whole life. And <clears throat> As uh, my colleague uh, Rosario said that, you know, it's really tough for, uh, you know, Hispanic Americans and Latin Americans living in the U.S. be able to, to live a, a more comfortable life compared to other Americans who have lived here for a longer time. Um, unfortunately, with, with that as well, you know, it's also African Americans and, and white Americans and Asian Americans who have been suffering uh, the stuff that we do as well. And every day it seems to be growing more and more. And, um, you know, even in rural communities and in urban communities. Uh, also with, my, my, my question is more detailed into the rent control. 
because that's also a big uh, issue that's going on. Um, how would you be willing, would you and how would you be willing to enforce a rent control across the country, seeing that many Americans are looking forward to something like this? Yeah, well, you know, I, I can't say that I would support instituting rent control across the United States as a federal law. What I would support is allowing local communities to uh, institute rent control in their own communities. And this recently came up in California. As you may know, there are some cities in California, like San Francisco, uh, and I think a couple of others that have rent control. And the question, uh, I, I believe before the voters, was whether there should be a broader access to rent control. In other words, other communities should be allowed to provide or institute rent control uh, within their boundaries. I believe that local communities should be able to do that um, because in some communities that's probably the answer. In other communities, it's not the answer. You know? And so I don't know that in that case a one-size-fits-all approach is the best approach. Uh, I think that the sensitivity to the different conditions in different cities is probably a better approach. There are other ways, though, important ways and effective ways that we can make sure that people have housing opportunity. We can make big investments in affordable housing, and we haven't done that in a long time. In the Obama administration, for instance, in the last fiscal year where the Obama administration proposed a budget, we proposed this plan of investing $11 billion over 10 years to end family homelessness, including by investing in a lot of affordable housing. So, you know, there are other ways that we can get at that in addition to allowing local communities to impose rent control if that's what their local representatives believe is best. But I would not do that as a national policy. I don't think that that's the best solution. My name is Lorelei, and I have a originally from Southern California, um, but I've lived out here on and off for a few years in Las Vegas. Um, my question has to do with um, predatory practices when it comes to landlords and um, property management companies. I recently went through a situation where I rented a house from a property management company and um, I assumed that it would be ready for me to move in there. Uh, by the time I was supposed to, but it turned out to be uninhabitable. Mm. And so what can be done to um, to help stop the predatory practices of some you know, landlords, slumlords, and um, property management companies? Well, I think this is a perfect example of why it's important that we have um, strong investments in consumer protection agencies in states across the United States. And as I'm sure you know, there are some states that I think take consumer protection more seriously than others. Um, at uh, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, they take at the federal level consumer protection very seriously. And unfortunately, during this administration, um, they've been a target. Uh, this administration has t tried to weaken the CFPB. I would actually go in the other direction to try and strengthen them, whether it's holding um, financial services firms accountable, firms that do auto loans or other type of loans, uh, or what you're talking about. We want to be a strong partner with states and local governments to protect consumers, not to weaken those protections. In addition, uh, we need to look at ways, uh, sensible ways, that Congress can ensure that laws reflect 21st century practices, right, that we regulate in a smart way, not in an overly burdensome way, but I think in a smart way. Uh, so that we protect consumers. Because I remember as city councilman, as mayor, as HUD secretary, hearing a lot of people talk about examples of how as a consumer they had fallen victim to a scam or to dishonest uh, uh, companies or just any number of circumstances and feeling like they often seemed like they had no help, like they were lost. right? We need to make sure that in local communities um, that there are strong consumer protection entities, yeah, including nonprofits. Yeah. Hola, señor Castro. Buenas tardes. Hola. Buenas tardes. 
usted ya lo dijo, los sueldos. Yo he luchado por varios años para que nos paguen 15 dólares. Varios años. Entonces, si no tenemos un sueldo bueno, pero nos siguen subiendo las rentas, ¿qué vamos a hacer? En, 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 en una forma como a mí me, 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 me hace daño es que yo tengo un sueldo bajo. Fui a rentar una casa, un apartamento. El dueño se cambia, lo vende y el nuevo dueño aumenta la renta. Los nuevos que, ven, que vienen llegando pagan 100 dólares más que yo. Entonces es, es algo que de algo así se va haciendo así, así, así. Nadie los para. Pero el problema no es pagar la renta, sino el problema es que tenemos unos, un, unos sueldos muy bajos. Sí, sí. ¿Tienes? Eso yo, yo quisiera que cuando usted sea presidente se enfoque en eso, porque casi la mayoría de gente pobre, porque la, la gente mediana no sufre, pero la gente pobre es la que sufre más, porque ganamos muy poco y pagamos mucho. ¿Qué pasa? Van a venir los Raiders... Todas las casas se pusieron a subirlas, todas las rentas se pusieron a subirlas. Nosotros no tenemos que ver en eso, porque al rato si viene, pasa lo que se acuerdan 10 años con Obama, se viene todo para abajo, otra vez. Entonces hay que tener un enfoque para el futuro, para que todos, la gente pobre, estemos en un nivel más o menos, pagando más o menos una renta, no una casa, una, una renta, pero que vivamos con nuestras familias, no estar trabajando dos sueldos, dos trabajos, dejando a nuestros hijos solitos, uh -huh. llegar en la, irnos a las 4 de la mañana, llegar a las 4 o 5 de la tarde, eso es mucho. No nos rajamos, por ser hispano no nos rajamos, pero no hay que ser tanto. Le pido cuando usted, si Dios nos, nos presta vida a usted, presidente, ayúdenos por favor. Sí. Y, y, uh, Martín. Muchísimas gracias por su pregunta. Uh, just the translation of the question is, uh, his question uh, and comment is that um, with, the, with regard to rent, that the rents keep going up higher and higher, but also the problem is that wages have not kept up with that. And he's saying that, you know, that he makes a relatively low wage and it gets harder and harder to afford the rent. And that's the, the case for a lot of people here in Las Vegas and throughout the country. And his question is, uh, if I'm president, what am I going to do um, on both ends with regard to the rent and also wages? And so let me say that it's been almost a decade. It's been almost 10 years since we raised the minimum wage. We need to raise the minimum wage in this country to $15 an hour so that we actually pay people for the hard work that they do and allow them to earn a living wage uh, so that they don't have to work two or three jobs. They can put food on the table and they can pay the rent. Um, you know, in some ways, in some places, even $15 as a minimum wage is not, a, a not enough to afford a two bedroom apartment. In some places, in a few places, not even a one bedroom apartment. But I do think that it's progress. Um, and I'm committed, if I'm president, to pushing legislation to raise the minimum wage to $15. Fortunately, we've already seen examples uh, like in Seattle and a few other cities that have done that. And before those communities did it, uh, a lot of people said that the sky was going to fall. You know? And that didn't happen. Uh, we can do that. With regard to rents, uh, as I said, I, I believe that we need to, to, to attack it in two ways. Number one, we need to invest a lot more resources into housing supply so that people can find affordable housing. But what about the people who already have a place to live and we, how do we make sure that they can stay in their home? Um, that's where we need to look at creative ways to, through our tax code and other ways, actually give renters an advantage. A lot of what we do right now focuses on homeowners, for instance, right? You can traditionally deduct um, the interest on your mortgage, for instance, right? During the course of this campaign, I look forward to putting forth a plan that actually speaks to afford affordable housing opportunity and also addresses renters and not just homeowners, although I also believe that we need to provide relief for homeowners. Right? 
Hi, my name is Miriam. I've lived here for more than 12 years. I'm uh, also a DACA recipient, and I have started my family recently. I'm happily married, and I have a two-year-old now. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you talked about the uh, rental control and the daycare and um, like all of the topics that have been like talked about today um, or right now um, have really like affected like talk about everything that I'm going through right now. And right now, I can't afford to move out of my mom's house. Um, for the same thing, and you know, my um, husband is staying home to provide like good childcare for my son. So I'm having to choose like you know between being able to move out, being able to take care of my son, and being able to work a full-time job, um, and also not being scared of when I'm gonna be able to stop working because as a DACA recipient and everything that's going around immigration, that's also like it's not as so safe for me because like I wanna think about my future, this is my career, and I don't wanna be scared of like, I'm not gonna have a permit anymore, and what am I gonna do once I no longer have a social? Like this is my job, and my employee wants to have me as an employee, but he won't be able to without me having like an immigration status, so. Yeah, well, first of all, um, we need to make sure that uh, for our undocumented immigrant community, that they can have the peace of mind of knowing that they're going to be able to stay here as we figure out the issue of comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, if I'm president, I'm committed to pursuing legislation to pass comprehensive immigration reform that will include DREAMers. Um, I'm disappointed what this administration has done with DACA. My hope is that the Supreme Court will protect it and give, in the short term, give DREAMers peace of mind. But we also know that the longer term solution is legislation. And I really do believe that in January of 2021 that we're going to have a Democratic Senate, a Democratic House, and a Democratic President. We're going to have another opportunity to do comprehensive immigration reform. And the lesson of 2009 and 2010 is don't wait. I'm committed to not waiting and to putting forth legislation. Um, I believe that our immigrant community, both documented and undocumented, contribute greatly to the success of this country. And I'm disappointed that this president has demonized undocumented immigrants. Um, I believe that, like you, uh, the vast majority of people who are here who are undocumented, whether they're dreamers or, or they're not dreamers, are law-abiding. They're very good people. They're providing for their family. They're working hard. They have the same values that have made our country very special over the years. They have a love of country. Many have often served in the military defending our country. Uh, and so as a nation, we need to address being able to give them peace of mind and put them on a path to citizenship. And we can still have a border that is secure. We don't have to choose between a secure border and being compassionate and doing what's in the best interest for our economy also in the long run. Right. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Castro. My name is Sulma, and I've been in Las Vegas most of my life. I work in the front office of an elementary school. And um, I just wanted to share my personal story. So since I do work in the front office, I see a lot of parents come in and they want to sign their kids up for pre-K. We have a waiting list at our school and the previous one that I worked at. And I have to turn parents away a lot of the times and tell them that uh, they don't have the age requirement or it's full. And I can see the concern on their face. I can see that it's a very inconvenient thing for them. And I can see that they're in their own head trying to figure out what am I going to do now? What's, what's the plan? What do I have to change? And um, I guess my question is, if you were to be elected, um, how would you go about, because um, I know you probably have a lot of plans, what would, what would the priority of universal pre-K be? Yeah, well, it, it's a big priority for me. And let me say also that this is personal for me. I have a four-year-old son named Christian. And just about a week ago, my wife Erica and I got a text from the school district where we're 
trying to enroll our local school district that we live in, public school district, trying to enroll our son for pre-K. Uh, and it's basically a lottery where we're trying to enroll him. And we got a text message that said, Christian got in. And we were very happy that now he's going to have a place to be and to start learning and in a great environment. But it shouldn't be by lottery. Everybody should have the opportunity. Every child should have the opportunity to get a great pre-K education, whether you're, you don't make very much money at all, whether you're poor or whether you're middle class. Because in a lot of these states, like Texas, they have income cutoffs. And so if you're in the middle class, if you're a child of a middle class family, but the family can't afford pre-K, uh, a lot of them are not able to send their kids to pre-K. If you're a poor family, even though pre-K is available, oftentimes you don't have the transportation you know, to get your child there on time. If you're taking the bus and you have to take two or three buses. So all of these things are connected. Uh, Pre-K education is a big priority for me. I've made that a big part of my campaign. And if I'm president uh, in my first term, I will submit to Congress an education plan, education legislation that includes universal pre-K. Uh, because I think that it's that important to an economy that is going to require more skill and more education than ever. And also to making sure that nobody gets left behind in this 21st century. Right. Hi, my name is Katie. Um, I'm born and raised in Vegas. Um, I'm a teacher within CCSD and I come from uh, a family who's been teaching within the district for 40 plus years. Um, so my question also has to deal with universal pre-K and I just have, I guess, a deeper question into how you would make sure that it would reach um, all families across all different diverse situations and that it would um, reach uh, equity in um, different socioeconomic situations. No, thanks a lot. Um, well, I think that if we're going to have truly universal pre-K, it's, it's going to mean that it reaches every public school district out there and that those districts have the capacity to be able to stand up effective, excellent pre-K programs. And so it's going to have to be something, I think, you know, as I see it, that gets phased in because it's not like we're going to do this from, from one year to the next. It's going to take some time. But I believe that we can base it off of great models that are out there in school districts across the country, um, including school districts that have very diverse populations. I remember, for instance, when we were looking at doing pre-K for SA in San Antonio, one of the school districts that we visited was the Houston Independent School District. You know, Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the United States now. You know, sometimes people think of Houston and they think of it, in, you know, that urban cowboy, that movie, and you know, so we still have cowboys in Texas. <laughs> And we have a football team called the Cowboys. But we also, in Houston, uh, have uh, people from all over the world um, who trace their heritage to many different countries. And many languages are spoken in that school district. I think that there's a lot to learn at a federal level when we go forward with legislation about how these diverse school districts that serve populations that um, have many different needs include many different vulnerable communities, including poor communities, how they have done a good job with it. And, uh, you know, I have no doubt that we can create excellence no matter where people are, whether it's a, a rural school district or it's in the middle of Houston or Chicago or New York or wherever. Um, you know, and I'm committed to holding school districts accountable to make sure that that money is well spent. Yeah. Uh, I've been living in Vegas uh, around 19 years now. I was, I've been uh, here through the whole school system, from elementary to high school, um, and um, been an organizer uh, for about 10 years now in my community, uh, organizing different communities from um, workers, minimum wage workers to immigrant families, um, and just hearing stories every day, talking to people. Um, the, I think that it all connects, all the, all the fights 
uh, the issues of all connect and it's something that been connecting with the community that you, having a economic justice and when we talk about that it's about like we talk in this room how important it is uh, having a living wage um, and also having a, um, affordable housing um, and just in my experience uh, as, as a son of immigrants I see I seen my family uh, my parents work day and night really hard um, to make sure that we had everything um, and then sometimes we f I felt like it wasn't the system that being created wasn't really fair for my family when why do they have to be uh, stuck paying um, jobs that they, they give you poverty wages uh, or living in neighborhoods that are something unhealthy unsafe um, and and just like I felt that it was really unfair uh, I just wanted to see that our families deserve better. Uh, we want to make sure that we do have a person that's going to be speaking for all families. Um, having a, a dad, my dad sitting next to me, um, in front of me, um, working a minimum wage job, working for a multi million dollar company, just want to see fairness. Um, we, we lost our mother um, because it wasn't fair, the system that had been created. Like, she worked day and night, um, ha not having able to call off work because she felt sick and had to go to work. Um, and, and I think if we had, like, some, like, earned pay sick days, it's something that we're pushing here a lot in, in, in Las Vegas, in Nevada. Um, if she would have the opportunity to at least call off to do checkups, monthly checkups, if she was getting paid a living wage, um, that she would be able to not, oh, I have to go to work because I can't pay the rent. Especially when the crisis hit Vegas, when everybody lost jobs, construction went down. My dad was working construction. He lost his job. Um, and I think that if we fight for an economic justice that includes living wages, affordable housing, that people can actually have earned paid sick days where they can get checkups and stuff, families wouldn't be, um, families wouldn't be um, going through what we did. That we lost, I lost my mom. Um, that she, there wasn't any kind of justice heard for families here. Just want to make sure that we give a voice to all our families because all our families matter. Um, it doesn't have to be um, certain issues because all the issues connect at the end of the night um, and that we have to fight for, for our communities to make them stronger, healthier, and actually safer. And at the same time, it creates opportunities that gives everyone the same opportunities. So. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, and Lo siento. I'm very sorry to hear about your mother. Um, I think that the first way to think about these things is to start from a place of respect for everybody's humanity. That all of us are more than our jobs. All of us are more than what we create for our employers or the people that we're working for. Um, that everybody has a value. And I've been very happy over the last two or three years to see the conversation around this nation move toward a recognition of the value of each human being when we propose universal health care so that no matter who you are you can get health care coverage you can get health care when you need it when we propose raising the minimum wage to a livable wage so that you're getting paid something that's closer to what your value the value that you're giving. Um, so that, as others have said, everybody can have dignity as they work. And the sum of all of that is that things that happen, the kind of thing that happened to your mother, doesn't happen to other families in the future. Paid sick leave is another part of that. I and Several other of the people running in this race believe in that, believe in universal health care. We believe in a living wage. We believe in paid sick leave. We believe in respecting the basic humanity of people beyond the economics of it. And we want to look out for our vulnerable communities especially. You, know, you said to something that I think 
is very straightforward, but is also very profound, which is that all of these things are connected. Our health, to our family, to our housing opportunity, the education that our children get, right? whether we're able to reach our dreams in life. And we'll go back to the first question that Isaiah asked. And we said that we have to start thinking about all of these things, all of these things and how they work together. And especially how vulnerable communities and vulnerable people are impacted by them. If I'm president, I want to be a president, and I will be a president, that doesn't forget where I came from. Because I grew up with a grandmother who spent her life scrubbing floors and washing dishes as a maid and puts into practice that basic respect for humanity through the kinds of things that we've talked about tonight. All right? Thank you. Thank you. All right, one more question. Hi, Mr. Castro. Um, like I said, my name is Sulma, and I do have a question because I am also a DACA recipient, and I do know that the immigrant community um, definitely shows up to vote, and they're very interested, and we have very large numbers. And like you said, you're interested in immigration reform. This is a very personal topic for me. My mom is actually undocumented. Um, she will never be able to retire because she doesn't have a social security. So that's something that I have to think about. I have to think about my family apart from myself. Um, like sh uh, she mentioned earlier, our situation is really up in the air and there's no um, place to feel comfortable. So like you said, you do want to tackle immigration reform. I know it's something that people have talked about it in the past, have tried to do it in the past. Um, what do you feel that you can provide if you were to be elected as president to you know, definitely deliver on that promise because like I said, um, people vote, people get very excited when they talk about immigration reform. We just want to hold our politicians accountable to what they're yeah. saying, so. Well, thank you for the question and let me begin by you know, acknowledging that there may be people out there that now when somebody says, I'm gonna do comprehensive immigration reform, they may not believe it because they've heard it before and it still hasn't happened. What I will say is that I really do believe that we're going to have a different opportunity this time. Um, last time in 2013 with comprehensive immigration reform, it got 68 votes in the Senate. And if it had been voted on in the House of Representatives, people believe that it would have passed. And a Democratic president, President Obama, would have signed it. The Republican Speaker of the House did not allow it to get a vote on the House floor, and so it was never past. This time, I believe that we're going to have a Democratic President, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House. I think that we can muster support, enough support in the Senate. And I believe that if it's taken to a vote on the House floor, it's a democratically controlled House, that we can pass it in the House. And if we have a Democratic President, I believe, frankly, that any of the Democrats running, if they're president, including me, would sign that legislation. What I'm saying is that I will make that a priority. You know, I believe that the lesson of 2009 is not to wait. Um, in the meantime, you know, I applaud all of the efforts of activists who are resisting, who are protesting, who are pushing back against the inhumane approach that this administration has taken, separating little children from their mothers and their fathers, which is wrong. You know, I would stop that immediately. I don't believe in, in that kind of family detention. Uh, I believe uh, that we should take the target off the back of people who have uh, temporary protected status, a TPS, uh, and also improve our legal immigration system so that it doesn't take forever for people who have applied in that system to be able to become citizens. I would do both improve our legal system, and then humanely and compassionately create a path to citizenship for the undocumented immigrants who are here. And, and do that with that democratic majority that we have in 2021. Thank you all so much for those questions, and thank you, uh, Secretary Julian Castro.
Um, these issues that all vary from immigration to universal pre-K to rent control and affordable living are all things that we go through every day. And unfortunately, it's not just us that have to go through these things, but everybody in our community and um, across the nation. And you know, at the same time, that is a power that we continue to have to try to make these things happen. And so again, thank you so much for joining us in this living room conversation. And again, thank you so much, thank Secretary. Thank each and every one of you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.